Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Professor Gao. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Professor Sarah Mers. Hope you are doing well. Doing well. Doing well. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, is this is the last lecture. Yeah. If if you want, we can give uh, another one on Tuesday. But Thursday, I will. Uh, Will this? Uh, I mean, the AT and T is going to disconnect my my Wi-Fi. Okay. okay. No, and this, this I'll be fine. moving out. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I uh, I just want to make sure um, you. <coughs> uh, there's an announcement by the uh, Springer WeChat, and uh, uh -huh. they went with the original plan, which is uh, uh, which ends. Uh, next Thursday, um, so uh, but it's okay. Uh, I told them this is the last lecture of the series, and um, uh, if we uh, if there's a need, we can open uh, maybe a, a question and answer session uh, if needed on on Tuesday. But um, uh, okay. but uh, but I doubt it. It's uh, probably we can wrap it up today. We can do some uh, Q&A today and um, see if we can wrap it up. Give you some more time to uh, get your things in order. All right. That would be great. Um, okay. Now we have uh, quite some few attendants. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let us uh, continue with the uh, with the development we were exploring last time on a parallel to the process that you normally go about when you're doing ADRC for continuous time. We parallel that into the discrete time and for native systems, for native discrete time systems, we found that the, the result is very much similar to the continuous time in, in many, many respects, but it lacks an essential feature of ADRC, which is the robustness. So our, our intent today will be to give you one way to make the, the entire approach reasonably robust, but especially for, for native systems. I mean, systems which do not necessarily come from a sampling process. If, if you have a system described in exactly the, uh, your you know, approximately discretized uh, equations using the Euler-Lagrange, or even if you have an exact discretization of the system, then uh, there are some things that can be done and uh, the approach will be naturally robust. But in, in native systems, like uh, many economic systems that we will have the chance to explore, um, in this lecture, the, the process is, it has to be constrained somehow to the estimation of the disturbance. And that propagates through sensitivity functions in a manner in which provides 
features to the closed loop system. Uh, when this modified naive ADRC controller is properly set into an ADRC kind of, uh, of form. So let's, let's continue with a very simple example uh, because that's the easiest way to understand the issue. And we have a reduced order observer for the dynamics of the system in which artificially we're assuming that X2 is measurable, although our aim is to obtain a transfer function description of the controller. And therefore the fact that this is not available doesn't matter, the end result is implementable because this, this uh, observer will not be directly implementable unless we transform it by means of a state coordinate transformation, this, this part of the observer. But that's not necessary and that clouds the development. So we have a reduced order observer with a fake output, which is the advance of the input, uh, the advance of the output. And uh, this would be the, the, the natural form. We copy the dynamics of, of the system. We replace the disturbance by an estimation variable Z. And now we put some filter in front of the, of the expression that we would like to have for C. So we use the same uh, endogenous injection as, as a correction factor. And we put here, um, a filter, some kind of filter, which will generate the disturbance estimate. And the idea is to propagate that through the sensitivity functions in order to see if there is a natural filter that will provide us with robustness. So when we do that, the estimation error for the, for the only state that we're artificially estimated by means of a fake, fake injection is given by this expression where we just copied the, the form of the filter. And therefore, doing some rearrangement to obtain the sensitivity functions, we obtain the estimation error of the state variable, we obtain the estimation error of the disturbance input, and we obtain uh, an equivalent expression for C, which will, uh, you know, benefit from the substitutions that we obtain from all these equations and we obtain this, this set of, of, of sensitivity functions. This is the state estimation error uh, sensitivity function with respect to the disturbance input. This is the estimation error of the disturbance in relation with the disturbance itself. And this is the disturbance estimate in terms of the disturbance itself. So this, all these have the same uh, denominator in the transfer function and whatever changes is only uh, carried out in the numerator. So th these, are, these, these are the sensitivity functions and now our, our um, objective is to try to determine at least a, a crucial property for G in order to have some robustness with at least with respect to the simplest disturbance input that you can imagine, which is just a constant disturbance, constant but unknown disturbance. It turns out that in the continuous time case, that recipe uh, goes a long way into providing robustness to the, to the ADRC scheme. What you obtain naturally without doing any further extensions, but just the first order extension is uh, a, a pole in the in the origin, and this pole in the origin for the for the uh, controller goes a long way to to eliminate not only uh, the effect of constant disturbances, but it also acts in a robust manner in the estimation scheme to to attenuate sufficiently uh, the the effect of the disturbance on all the estimation errors and on the disturbance transfer function itself. So this, this would be the propagation of, of the filter transfer function to all these sensitivity functions. And then uh, you apply the final value theorem. One of the things we would like to have as a property is that this estimate is exact 
when the disturbance is constant. If that estimate is exact when the disturbance is constant, then the, the estimate of the state will be exact because you can cancel the disturbance exactly and obtain just a simple chain of delays or advances. And the estimation of the disturbance, of course, would, would, would also be um, uh, exact. So uh, with this in mind, we have straightforwardly applied the, the uh, final value theorem to the uh, disturbance variable, to the, est to the estimate of the disturbance variable in terms of the transfer function that we just saw in the last slide, and we obtain this expression. When Q goes to one, which is the, the natural way to obtain the final steady state value of the, of the variable C, which is estimating the disturbance, there is a cancellation of the transfer function of the constant disturbance, which has an amplitude psi bar, and it has this transfer function. When you cancel that, and uh, you realize that this would be your, your transfer function, you get g of one in the denominator and you observe very simply that if g of one were zero then lambda zero cancels and the amplitude of the of the constant disturbance becomes equal to the steady state value of the disturbance estimate so you would have this condition this asymptotic condition would, would which would guarantee a perfect estimation of the disturbance in the constant case. And uh, for that, we need that the filter satisfies this very simple property, g of one should be zero. Therefore, you should have, uh, you should have that infinite uh, attenuation at that, at that particular frequency. So when you, so this, this g one has, the one has to be a zero of the transfer function of that filter. And moreover, when you compute the sensitivity function in terms of uh, the filter of the filter um, transfer function you obtain by application of the final value theorem that g will introduce a zero in the in the transfer function of the sensitivity function of with respect to the disturbance and since g of one is zero the final value of y uh, the, the final value of y is zero, which means y is being stabilized to the value zero. The, the problem originally was a stabilization problem. So that, that, that is a nice property because now you have exact asymptotic convergence of the output variable to the, to the desired value of zero with no effect of the constant disturbance. And um, of course the same goes goes for the tracking, the, the tracking problem, the output reference trajectory tracking problem. The dynamics is just the same. And the only modification is that what you're dealing with is the input error. And the input error is obtained as the difference between the actual error and the nominal, uh, nominal control input. The nominal control input is obtained through the inverse of the plant straightforwardly if you in this very simple system, you know the inverse of the plan very well, then you have the input error acting as a, as a control input and the tracking error acting as the output. The tracking error is the difference between the actual output and the nominal value of the uh, output reference trajectory for the flat output in this instance. So doing that, you, you obtain now a realization of the filter, which is quite natural. Uh, we, we use an accumula accumulator strategy in the estimation of the, of the disturbance. The reduced order observer is exactly the same with the same location of the uh, estimated disturbance. But now we introduce this corrective action in terms of quote unquote integral control uh, in the discrete time case uh, in a manner that, that synthesizes uh, your filter very naturally. This, this would be your, your, uh, your filter that provides you with robustness. 
And uh, when, you, when you again propagate that, you obtain exactly the same properties as before. And it satisfies the condition that g of one should be zero. So you have a, you have a pole in Q equals one for the, for the estimation dynamics, the disturbance estimation dynamics injected by this, uh, by this estimation error. So in doing that, you obtain the following set of transfer functions. And from here, it is quite clear that locating that pole, uh, that, that pole in the controller becomes a zero in the sensitivity functions. And that zero is responsible for the asymptotic convergence of all these errors precisely to zero. And therefore making the estimation of the only state variable that is being estimated equal to zero in steady state and the estimation of the constant disturbance also becomes zero in the final value. So the disturbance itself exhibits this property and the transfer function uh, provides you with, uh, with uh, a direct transmission between the disturbance which would be constant and the actual estimate of the disturbance because the denominator when Q becomes one, the denominator collapses to lambda zero, and therefore you have a cancellation and you have no gain relating the disturbance input to the actual estimate of that disturbance. So that, that, um, that is explained in this, in this view graph, and um, therefore you have a very simple property of this, of this uh, zero or this pole located uh, in the controller and bestowing uh, the necessary arrangements or the necessary adjustments for all the sensitivity transfer functions uh, related to the operation of the ADRC controller in a nice manner. In fact, we can go ahead and propose the, the ADRC controller as customarily done in terms of the only estimate that is being used in, in this scheme, uh, feeding back the, the uh, actual output, feeding back the estimate of the next output, and uh, canceling the disturbance. When you do that, then you obtain a, a, a transfer function, a sensitivity transfer function in closed loop, which looks very much like this. And uh, there you have again, in the control scheme, the presence of this cancellation of the dynamics of the disturbance when the disturbance is constant. And uh, that cancellation in terms of the internal model principle is very well justified because the controller contains this as a denominator and therefore a model of the disturbance is being bestowed on the controller, which turns out to be this expression. This is the internal model principle acting for you in the, in the necessary cancellation that at least for the simplest kind of disturbance you, you require from an ADRC scheme, which is, uh, which is quite, um, quite well known in continuous time. And um, with, with that possibility, then, then uh, we go ahead and we the same example that we presented before, we have a perfect tracking, of course, after some, after some uh, transient that, that can be accommodated by better tuning the, the gains in the observer and the controller. But at least what we want to show here is that you have perfect tracking uh, in the presence of a constant disturbance and perfect estimate of, uh, of the state of the system. And of course, the control now tries to overcome that constant disturbance, so the controller contains a constant term which is converging towards the actual value, and therefore you have an offset for the controller because the controller is, is adding that precise constant to the feedback so that it cancels the actual value of the disturbance in closed loop. So this is, this is what you obtain. You obtain uh, what you desire, and this, this looks more like, like ADRC. Of course, there is a lot that we, what one can say about how to reduce this uh, overshoot at the beginning, which in the continuous time, uh, it also tends to be like that, except if one, one uh, is careful with the pole, and pole location of the observer and the, 
uh, and the controller, then we can have a very nice response in, in simple terms. But um, at least this is what you obtain. And uh, the performance of that very same controller for an arbitrary disturbance, which is constituted by this sequence of pulses will be also reasonable in the in the sense that uh, that of course you will have some small deviations here and there but the nature of the disturbance now is completely generic and uh, you would expect uh, that uh, the the uh, the tracking error cannot be made to precisely go to zero but it will be sort of you know, oscillating with a small amplitude around the actual uh, trajectory. And uh, the estimation of the state is also, is also nicely done and uh, the control is quite reasonable. Therefore, we have uh, reasons to expect uh, a robust behavior with respect to some disturbances which are of this, of this form. In fact, one of the justifications is you know all these all these uh, pulses that appear here in fact are algebraic sums of unit steps uh, delayed in time so there is for any disturbance of this sort you can propose at least uh, in an abstract manner uh, uh, an infinite sum of uh, of unit step unit steps delayed uh, by by the appropriate uh, time shift in order to conform a function like this. And for a reasonably large class of disturbances, you will have you will have a nice effect. If the if the disturbances are supposed to be low frequency, that means that probably you have uh, less than than uh, a wiggly appearance as this, and you will have slower disturbances changing uh, not as often as this one at every at every step but let's say uh, after a certain number of steps there will be a change and so on so piecewise constant disturbances are the equivalent or the analog of low frequency disturbances in the, the continuous time and low frequency disturbances will mean that uh, this will either vary very, very small amounts from step to step, or they will not vary at all during a, a, a finite interval of time. And, uh, and that, that is uh, probably the justification that a simple filter, like a, an integrator or an accumulator, works for you in the observer of the disturbance by introducing that, that internal model or approximate internal model of the disturbance in the discrete time arena. And by doing that, you obtain the necessary robustness that uh, allows you to, to, to say that this is more likely uh, of, a, of an ADSC control. Of course, the system itself, yes. Yes, Professor Gao? No, go ahead. I'm sorry. OK. Uh, if your system itself is sampled, then you will have this integrator effect in the model of the system. If you have a native system, then you will not have that effect. And uh, if you have a, a chain of integrators, like uh, what you obtain, or a chain of accumulators, like what you have when you sample the system, then, then uh, of course, you can propose a reduced order observer or a full order observer with the same characteristic and even bestow that to the estimation uh, extension. And therefore, you will be much more robust uh, in general because the dimension of the system tends to give you factors that go into the denominator of the, of the uh, of the sensitivity functions and will appear as, as, as uh, cancelling effects of certain power in the numerator of all those sensitivity functions. Uh, what, what also becomes transparent is that by doing that, you will not be able to improve this uh, very much because 
because you need uh, this, uh, there is no, no uh, compensation in the numerator for, for anything except the cancellation of the gain uh, when Q goes to one. So if you have something more general than this filter, then this, this uh, might not give you a zero. It, it, it means that the disturbance will not be exactly, uh, exactly estimated and that there will be some transmission from the actual disturbance to the estimated disturbance. But that is compensated by the fact that now uh, you have more canceling power, an internal model uh, that cancels the dynamics of the, of the disturbance is more likely by higher powers of, of this, uh, of this uh, binomial. And therefore, uh, we believe that from here one can propose a number of variations which are better, or even the addition of some other filters that, uh, you know, in the, classical, in the classical sense, those filters were of the uh, lead and lag type. They, they also have counterparts in continuous in discrete time. And therefore, all those, uh, all those possibilities uh, now emerge very clearly to better shape the sensitivity function uh, transfer functions of, of the system when you use ADRC. And that gives you uh, a nice design guideline in order to, to be robust, to be able to estimate the states, to be effective in a linear state feedback. And at the end, probably to, to obtain just the transfer function for the controller, which uh, in a hidden manner incorporates the effect of the observer and the effect of the cancellation inside a single transfer function. And uh, that is uh, known to be very easy to implement in, uh, in uh, many of the computational platforms that you have available for control systems like MATLAB, like Simnon, like uh, Maple and many others. Therefore, uh, let me give you an example of a flat system, which, uh, which will give you uh, just a, a possibility into ADRC in a very natural manner for, uh, for a system that tries to model uh, the, the economy. And uh, we have four variables that uh, integrate that model. This is the Samuels Samuelson's model of the national economy. So you have some national income uh, portrayed by this variable capital YK. You have the investment as I sub K. You have consumption during, during uh, a period. And we denote that by CK and the government expenditure. We will, uh, we will, uh, Suppose that the government expenditure is just the, uh, the control input. And uh, the, the theory simply says that the consumption is proportional to the natural income. So at some point in time, the, the, uh, the consumption carried out by the population and the, and the firms uh, is proportional to the national income. And that proportionality factor is called the multiplying factor. It's usually a factor between zero and one. And the investment is proportional to the growth. So uh, if you take the, con the, the consumption in, in one uh, year and the consumption in the year or the period immediately preceding that one, this difference measures the increment of consumption uh, that increment of consumption defines the investment through a, a proportionality factor, which is a positive factor called the acceleration factor in Samuelson's uh, terminology. So this is, this is a nice equation and um, because it tells you that in order to stimulate investment, there has to be some sustained growth. Of course, if, the, if everything is in equilibrium, and this is something what you realize, if everything is in equilibrium and the consumption is not growing, the investment is zero. So under equilibrium conditions, we have this, this, this fact that no growth, no growth of the consumption gives you no investment for that period. 
And uh, the national income is just the sum of the consumption, the investment, and the government expenditure. So you have uh, the, the, the natural income, the national income actually becomes an algebraic constraint that has to be satisfied at all times. And this is interesting because the model now is not a traditional model. You do have, um, you do have a, an algebraic equation which has to be precisely satisfied at all times. So this is, if you want, this is the counterpart of algebraic differential equations. This is an algebraic difference equation that will be, uh, that will be present in the model of economy. So we, we build a state uh, space model, including the algebraic equation. And for that, this, this matrix, which is popular in descriptor systems introduced by Luenberg many, many years ago, this descriptor uh, matrix gives you a zero row indicating that the sum of, of these things uh, that you know, the, there is no dynamics in this first equation. So the relation of the three state variables by means of these simple numbers and the expenditure gives you in the first equation, the algebraic restriction. So this system, even though it looks like a third order system because of the singularity of the descriptor matrix will be only actually second order because one of the equations is an algebraic equation that uh, would allow you to uh, substitute some of the terms in the other ones and obtain a second order equation. So everything is confined to this manifold where this condition is, is valid. So with this, with this uh, model, uh, we're pretty sure that uh, we have a discrete time system. Also, it, it is not in, in a canonical manner because it's a descriptor system. And we start by examining the possibilities of finding out the flat output. And let us, let us say from the beginning that this part of the investment equation is the present uh, impact of the consumption of this, the actual consumption in this period and the present period impacting the investment. So this, this term, complements with this other term, which is the impact of the previous, uh, of the previous consumption in the, in, the, in the past that is impacting the investment in, this, in the present time. So if we take the difference between these two quantities, it is clear that from these two quantities, the difference of these two quantities, IK minus BCK, that allows you to compute CK minus one. If you, if you want to obtain CK, you will have to propagate this difference to the future and divide that difference by the factor B. So knowing, knowing this, this difference allows you to know the consumption in a propagated manner in the present. If you know the consumption, then you know the national link because you know this, this multiplying factor. So knowing that part of the investment uh, equation allows you to compute the consumption in the actual period and the national income in the, in the actual period. And of course, knowing all that, now you can compute the investment by itself because you know CK, you know the difference of these two now you can compute IK because you now know CK. So you, three variables are already known from this very simple equation and this one. Knowing IK minus BCK allows you to compute CK in terms of this difference. That allows you to compute YK. You can also compute IK and therefore from this equation you can compute GK which is a control input. So it, it, is, it is clear that if I know the, the impact of the present period in the investment uh, policy, then I will be able to obtain a parameterization of all the variables in the system. And this is what we did here. So, Herbert, yes? Yeah, I have a question uh, on the previous slide. Can you go back? 
uh, one more. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by national income? National income is actually the sum of all the economic activity in the country. What people well, consume, what people are spending, consuming goods and services, all the investments that people make in durables, like, you know, housing and uh, things like that, uh, the investment well, that they make in, in, the, in the stock exchange and so on, savings. Well, yeah, so, so the definition is more like national economic activities. Because national economic yeah, that, that's, that's called national, the uh, activities. Right? Yeah, so, 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 so if you use this uh, equation uh, and apply it to, uh, to the US in the middle of the pandemic, right? <laughs> so, yes. So, so the uh, national uh, economic activity that's something uh, seem to be the controlled variable, uh, meaning that we want the, the, to be uh, more or less uh, constant. Yeah, but the control variable is the, the government expenditure. Right, so, so uh, CK in the, in the middle of this pandemic uh, drops like a, a cliff, drop off the cliff. A and then the government uh, put in the $2 trillion of uh, uh, yeah, stimulus. to boost, so, so, yeah, so to boost the economy. This, this equation explains what's going on. Yeah, in a, in a sort of manner. Today I was reading the news uh, that appeared yesterday. Uh, Amazon during this pandemic has made $450 billion because uh, it, it's incredible. And uh, the second one I think is, is, is Apple with, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Microsoft with the Teams product that made like $200 billion, things like that. So it is true, the, the national income, uh, if, you increase, if you increase the government expenditure, you're increasing, although a little bit artificially, the, 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 the national income and the national income will create incentive for consumption. Yeah, it's also interesting that th this equation may apply to uh, uh, in uh, individual industries, like, like the airline industry, the consumption, the, the uh, customer activity drops, drops off the cliff. But the, yes. uh, the, 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 the government came in and bailed it out. Yeah, so that's also, that's it's also exercising all the power through the control input, yes. Right, so, so that's also uh, uh, explain, explainable uh, by your equation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think we hit a singularity point in the with this pandemic, and and this is why you need a, an extra large amount of control input to put some energy into the system and, and start moving all the economic variables in a positive way. Right. True. Now, final final question uh, on the slide. Uh, I K investment by whom? Is this uh, the commercial investment? Is this the uh, individual? Yeah, investment? it's it's all the all the activity related to investment, like you know, uh, buying housing, investing in the market, investing in in your savings, investing in your retirement plan. Um, all the investments, all things that can reproduce some good for you in the future. So, so, so the uh, the equation I K equals B times the difference between con conception. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, investment stimulated by the consumption, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, if this if this increment is large, then then uh, then people are are more motivated to invest into firms that are making a good consumption or have a product that is widely consumed. And, uh, but if this thing, let's suppose that this thing goes negative because the consumption is less in this period than the previous one. So you have a, a negative investment. That means people are not investing. People are, 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 are pre preventing them from doing that and, and spending whatever they have because that's part of the psychology of, of the economic uh, dynamics. But of course, this is this is a, a very nice model, but it, it's very simple. It's only three dimensional, and uh, naturally, people have expanded this model to include many many sectors. And uh, this is only for illustration purposes. Uh, some intuitive feelings can be gained by studying this equation, and I believe 
that's what the economics students do, uh, getting some feeling for how the economy moves when they see these dynamics. But of course, uh, nobody would use this in a serious manner to advise the government what to do. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as we mentioned before, if we know this this portion of the of the uh, investment impact by means of consumption, it turns out that this is the flat output. And the reason it's the flat output is because all the variables, as we saw in the previous slide, all the variables can be parameterized in terms of that flat output and a finite number of its advances. And moreover, the control input, not only the state variables, so the pseudo state variables, because the system is actually two state variable and the rest, uh, the, the, the other variable is just part of a, an algebraic constraint. And the control input can all be put in terms of a parameterization, in terms of the flat output and finding the number of its advances. So definitely this portion of the investment uh, policy is what really gives you an output which is meaningful in the sense that it's related to everyone, including the control input, and it sort of so summarizes all the structural properties of the system. So this is a flat output. And this, the last parameterization of the control input renders in a natural manner the input-output system, which is a sort of uh, uh, an input-output equation with the advances of the output related to the actual input. And uh, as we saw, there is no question about the possibilities of interpreting this in a casual, in a causal manner. Therefore, we have a, a, a flat system. Uh, the, the idea in ADRC is to simplify the input-output dynamics, and this particular output is good to control because if you, if you fix an objective for Y, then, then you have the corresponding objective for the meaningful variables, which are the economic variables. And, uh, and moreover, you have, you have a clear uh, relation in which these signs tell you that, that the consumption sort of goes the other way to uh, the evolution of this flat output, and therefore you should be careful. If you want to, to have a, a certain objective consumption, you should drive this Y to a negative value. And uh, to drive Y to a negative value means that this portion of this investment scheme uh, should go to negative values in the sense that the investment has to be uh, over, overcome by the consumption through this uh, multiplying factor. And, uh, and that is uh, reasonable from an economic standpoint because you do need positive consumption, you need positive national income, and that is obtained only when these Ys are driven to an objective which is by itself negative. So uh, the flat output, remember, is an artificial output. And it gives you, it gives you a, nice, um, a nice parameterization that that is related to everyone, and therefore you can uh, translate your, your, your objectives from the knowledge of the economy or the knowledge of the policies that you want to implement uh, in terms of that flat output. And, and that flat output is controllable, it is observable, and even though the system is algebraic difference, it doesn't matter that the flat output has the same, the same meaning. So, any planification, any planning of the of the flat output will will give you a trajectory for the economic variables. And if you know uh, what you want to do with the economic variables, then that immediately translates to um, to the possibilities of obtaining a nice trajectory for the flat output, which is meaningful in terms of the economic variables. And uh, as far as the control problem goes, you have a, a second order system. And in ADRC, uh, you, can have, uh, you can have the influence of, uh, of external or exogenous variables affecting your input output dynamics. Of course, in, in the economic uh, 
environment, there are many, many disturbances uh, that might appear, which are not easy to quantify or which are not easy to measure. Who could have imagined that a large disturbance would occur this year in terms of, uh, of the economic variables by the appearance of a microscopic uh, element that would really disturb the entire planet? Nobody would have previewed that. And uh, therefore, large disturbances might appear in your, in your uh, nice equations. But also, if, if you, you might either choose to ignore part of the dynamics of the system, or you might uh, deem that uh, you're better off by estimating the contribution of these variables rather than, than wiring them up into your algorithm to be able to obtain a nice control policy. Both things are possible in terms of ADRC. In terms of ADRC, you're going to do a state feedback, and a state feedback provides you with an opportunity to cancel these terms if you know them well. If you don't want to cancel them directly, you can also have a nice estimate of those, of those uh, contributions of the state, and then approximately cancel them by means of your estimations. In, in essence, what you are, are confronted with is you have a, a pure uh, forward shift system affected by some disturbances, some of, of which can be endogenous, some can be endogenous. You have a gain that you might know very well or you might not know entirely well, and then you have to resort to some other scheme in order to cope with the fact that this gain might be unknown to you. But if you know the gain, and in this case, it's a constant gain, then it's very simple to obtain this simplified relation in which you have a, 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 a pure shift, forward time shift system in the presence of unknown disturbances. Some of those disturbances uh, is because you choose to neglect part of the dynamics. Some part of these disturbances are because they come from an exogenous source, like uh, relations of your economic model with other sectors. Um, for instance, the energy sector has been very important uh, as an independent sector because it has some endogenous component, but it also has exogenous components from the uh, imports of, of oil for a long, long time. Uh, for the first time in many, many years, the U.S. is, is totally independent of uh, external oil sources because it, it, through a new technology, developed the possibilities of producing at home everything that was needed. So in the energy sector, there used to be classically some exogenous components that were unpredictable and some endogenous components that uh, either were uh, expensive or difficult to measure or you'd simply choose to ignore in order to rely more on an, an estimate of those variables if your model is not precise and then through an estimation being able to cancel them. In this particular instance, we have a very simple endogenous uh, disturbance, which is constituted by contributions of the dynamics, of the internal dynamics alone. So with this, um, we obtain a state representation, which is causal, and the control is located in the present, and therefore you have a, a model like that. That model has a, a, an equilibrium point and the equilibrium point is very easy to characterize from, from this parametrization. If Y is going to an equilibrium point, C is also going to an equilibrium point, and better, this, this Y better be negative so that the consumption either becomes positive uh, or some desired value. And uh, therefore, that constant value propagates to the national income and to the investment. In equilibrium, the investment is zero, and the government expenditure is obtained by the sum of all these terms when y is equal to a constant value. So the, the equilibrium of the whole economic system in terms of the state variables of the native model is very easy to determine in terms of the parametrization already found now that the equilibrium is parametrized in terms of the equilibrium of the flat output. Therefore, you have, you have a view of uh, where you want to drive your system, uh, what you want to do with your system. You want to keep it in a certain equilibrium. 
then then all these uh, all these relations will give you a nice initial and final condition for the for the variables and also for the flat output and from that initial and final equilibrium you can plan your trajectory in order to achieve a trajectory tracking that that will lead you to the desired equilibrium value of the economic variables therefore um, they, uh, in, in fact, these two variables must have non-negative equilibrium. The investment, ideally, is, is going to be zero in equilibrium, so you want to, to uh, that's an inescapable fact, but uh, you're pretty glad with, you know, marginal investments uh, as compared to the growth and the size of the whole economy. But uh, that, that is what keeps us moving in, in some sense. Robert. Uh, you propose a controller. You have a second order system. You propose the second oh. order controller according to the recipe that we gave, and we bestow some, some robustness. Yes, Professor Gao? Uh, can you go back uh, to uh, the difference equation? Uh, two slides. Go back two slides. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe one more. Yeah, this one. Uh, at the bottom of this uh, 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 PBT, you have a difference equation. That, that's now describe your uh, system uh, using the uh, flat output, correct? Yes, this is, okay. the, is the flat output. So, so, so this, is par this parallels the differential equation in continuous time, correct? I mean... Uh, Sorry, can you repeat that? This parallels, we're developing a parallel uh, to ADRT in continuous time. So this, no, now we're trying to be robust. Right, so, so this, this parallel the difference equation in continuous okay. time, right? Yeah. So, so uh, from this point on, when you define uh, state space, when you define state variable, you have choices, right? So, so if you go to the next slide, in the next slide, you uh, at the bottom you you define this particular. Uh, this is more of a shift, uh, shift yeah. register type of. Uh, so of course, so. Yeah. yeah, this would give you a controllable canonical form, right? Yeah, it leads you to this form. Right. right. So 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 my, so my question is, uh, why do we not put it into a uh, uh, integral form? I mean, a uh, uh, accumulator form. Oh, because. The, the model is not a sample model. No, th th this has nothing to do with whether or not it's a sample. Or not. You, when you go from a difference equation to a state equation, you have choices. Now, the, the, the selection of state variables are not unique. And uh, why do you pick the particular uh, 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 set of variables over uh, some other choices? Uh, uh, for example, the, uh, the accumulator form. Yeah. In, in the in the scheme that we that we uh, introduce here with a very simple model, we, we assume that the, we had the system in native form. And what do, mean, what do you mean by native form? This is a register. This is a, you know, the, the discrete time can be represented in different uh, way in state space. Oh yeah, surely, surely I can add here Q one and subtract Q one, and therefore have an accumulated form. Only that the the equations uh, are a little bit more uh, complicated. You can you can do that certainly, if, uh, but in this in this case we call it native because it doesn't come from a sampling process. It doesn't come like the the model that we're here. All these all these equations come from a view of the economy in a theoretical sense, in an ideal sense that gives you all these uh, relations between variables which are important in the economic description of, of, the, of the national uh, activity of all the agents. But uh, it is true, it leads to a state space representation which is of the descriptive form. And, and therefore you will have an input output equation. In this input output equation, you have a number of representations that are possible. Indeed, indeed, you have them. And, um, and uh, of course, in the state space representation, you can bestow the sample type or the accumulator type or the chain of integrators type chain of accumulators 
type of model. Um, the, the, the reason we didn't do it is because, because the, uh, the, at some point, at some point, you're going to pay a price in the, possibly in the complexity of, of the observer and the controller. Why? Because the natural equations are not in integrator form. These equations, these state equations, are not in integrator form. But of course, you can, you can transform them into an integrator form with, by you know, adding the, the vector of, of states and then subtracting that vector of states and modifying this matrix. That is entirely possible. Right, right. You have a, a very nice scheme in order to do IDRC. That, that tends to, to give you uh, a, lot of, a lot of compensation, which, uh, which gives you, might give you a very nice performance. I, I didn't do it here because um, that is something that in the continuous time case uh, becomes also very interesting and intriguing. How come that a, a single extension of the dimension of the system is capable of estimating, you know, a total disturbance that can have uh, internal nonlinearities which are being uh, dismissed, or also external disturbances which might be quite complex. Uh, one single extension, and this is one of the beauties of ADRC in my viewpoint, one single dimensional extension gives you enough power to, to, uh, to obtain a good estimate. And that extension is responsible for the robustness of the, of the entire scheme. What we tried to do here was to portray the, the same, the same uh, property. One single e extension of these equations to which you ascribe a robustness property in terms of an integrator type of, of, um, of uh, process will buy you some robustness without modifying the intrinsic nature of the system that you obtain by by just algebraic manipulating yeah by by intrinsic by intrinsic i'm sorry by by the intrinsic nature of the system i feel like this is just my final comment i feel like we live in the shadow of professor han and yes. If you look at a different way of uh, representing a dynamic, a dynamic system in state space, there, there's an infinite number of them. Yes. Of, of all those, uh, uh, in 1979, he picked out the, the cascade integral form as a, a canonical form and from which all uh, uh, system design, linear or nonlinear, can be carried out. And yeah. uh, so, so uh, it's, let's go back to the uh, end of last lecture that uh, we talked about. Um, why uh, does ADRC need to be robotified? And uh, if we go with, if we parallel the development in, di in discrete time, uh, following the uh, uh, canonical form of a, can a cascade integral, the robotness comes naturally. It may be a little bit more complicated, not, yeah. not, not by too much, but I thought uh, it's important uh, to, uh, to keep in mind that um, the the premise of ADRT development yeah. is, is to put first the dynamic system in the cascade integral form, whether yes. it's linear, whether it's linear or nonlinear, whether it's discrete, uh, discrete or continuous. Yeah, that that is uh, that is um, that is very natural. Um, one one reason that motivated me to stick to that is if I put this in in integral form then the flat output might not be that simple. Mm. So, but but even, even though, uh, even if it comes out to be quite simple, then, then of course, what you say is absolutely right. You, you, you can choose to have uh, that integration structure naturally also, because you know, this has an infinite number of interpretations in, in, in the state space. And doing that, you, you gain quite a lot. What you gain is robustness with respect to everything. So, so my my uh, I suggest uh, that we let Haiyan take a look at this, put it in the cascade integral form, and see if uh, we can still obtain the flat output. Of course, of course. I think Haiyan is here, right? 
Yes, the fl the flat output won't change, but uh, the uh, state space form will be different. Right, but but uh, I think the question is, uh, can we obtain can can they discover the flat output in the uh, uh, cascade integral form? Okay, it it will coincide. I believe it will coincide with the with the continuous time counterpart of the flat output. Mm. Because structurally, you are also you are almost obtaining a derivative of you know a dynamical system in which the derivative quote unquote is is equated to the dynamics, and therefore all the structural properties of the counterpart in continuous time will be there, and therefore the flat output should be the same. So 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 maybe uh, higher can tell us tomorrow tomorrow yeah yeah whether or not it works out <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, it's 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 a, it's a great pleasure. And please feel free to do that because that that clarifies a lot of things for 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 myself and for the audience. Yeah. Okay. So we have a nice equilibrium, and uh, and therefore we can choose uh, the objective uh, in terms of the flat output in order to achieve that equilibrium. Of course, everything. All, all the state variables are related because they satisfy different equations and also they satisfy an algebraic equation, which is very important. Therefore, uh, the objective is, is somehow tied. All, all the variables are not free to take whatever values they want, as is normal in state space. But um, from, from here, the, the controller has this, this uh, the ADRC controller with the robust observation scheme with the integral part of the, of the disturbance observer uh, variable is already put into this, uh, this form. Therefore, you obtain a, a transfer function which is uh, of this manner. And um, let, let me just uh, remind you that this, this is like a generalized compensation network. In fact, if you think of dividing the numerator uh, through the denominator, which is of the same order, the first thing that emerges from this division is a proportional term. And then you continue uh, making, making the, the division in a, in, a, in a string manner, in a sort of a extended division, you will, obtain, you will start obtaining integrators, which are just uh, Q inverses in the discrete time domain. So for some reason, this is, this is called general, also called generalized proportional integral controller because deep in the structure of this controller, you have a proportionality factor arising from the division, the first term of the division of these two polynomials. And then you, you have a Laurent expansion in terms of Q inverses by accounting an infinite sum uh, expansion for the, for the transfer function. And that means you're integrating, quote unquote, in discrete time, naive manner, you're integrating uh, your, your uh, tracking error to generate the, the necessary control input with the help of the nominal control input. So here the, the problem is, is just to locate the, the, the roots of the characteristic polynomial of the closed loop system and just uh, spread the, the coefficients in, in, in this manner. And uh, we apply this to the, to the same, uh, I mean, we apply this, we plan the trajectory first of all for the flat output going from a negative initial equilibrium value to a negative final equilibrium value. And uh, this planning of the flat output just requires a, a Bezier polynomial interpolating between, uh, smoothly interpolating between the initial value and the final desired value. With that parametrization, we have a complete trajectory for, for the flat output. And that uh, allows me to compute the nominal trajectories for all the states with, with the knowledge of this nominal flat output trajectory, I can obtain all the variables in the system in a, in, a, in a manner that doesn't require any integration, quote unquote, of the difference equation. 
It's just a substitution into the parametrization. And therefore, by choosing that, you will, you will obtain a consumption that goes up or a national income that goes up or an investment that arose from, from an equilibrium condition and goes back to the equilibrium condition after some tranching. And, um, and this is, uh, you know, this is uh, the effect of, of the ADRC controller now being quite robust with respect to the perturbations. And the perturbations here have two terms. One of the terms is, you know, exogenous perturbation. This is only portraying the exogenous disturbance, which is relatively small, but wiggly and, uh, you know, time varying. And you have also an exogenous disturbance. These are the contribution of the terms that uh, we didn't want to take into account in our simplified dynamics for, for many reasons. Either you don't want to implement them or you want to rely on an estimate of that, or you simply ignore that dynamics because what you know it's important in this particular case is the, the input-output relation and the states generated by that simplified model. And therefore, from there, you can, you can uh, give yourself the, the uh, luxury of, of uh, not taking into account the internal part of the dynamics and then estimate. And this is, this is the actual portrayal of the contribution of that part of the dynamics, which is quite important. By no means you can say that this is a small, a small disturbance as compared to the, to the range of the, of the economic variables. This is, this is quite important. And in fact, it's very important in, in, in terms of the relative value of that disturbance with respect to the, with respect to the flat output. And uh, nevertheless, the controller, just with that robust estimation for the disturbance input has a very nice performance, regardless of the of the input, uh, the exogenous disturbance and the endogenous disturbance, which is quite large. You have a nice tracking of the of the national income in terms of of what you pre-compute with the flat with the flatness property. You can pre-compute the nominal value of y, the nominal value of the consumption, the nominal value of the investment, and the nominal value of the government expenditure. And your control just, just manages from a, uh, an initial deviation from the equilibrium condition, manages to stabilize the system and to accurately track the trajectory of your system. Therefore, these, um, I, I believe that this performance is, is, is quite, quite uh, reasonable and naturally you, you maybe you want to, to better a little bit the, the overshoot and so on. Yes, Professor Gao. <laughs> yes, uh, very interesting uh, results. Uh, while you are describing this, I, I was thinking if we can simulate the, the, the uh, um, disturbance, uh, extortionist uh, disturbance uh, as relates to uh, the economic shutdown during the pandemic. And uh, <laughs> And then uh, another uh, variable that, uh, that's being introduced in as a GK, as a, a control variable, is the uh, stimulus. So, yeah. so uh, both from the government, the first one was uh, uh, in response to the, uh, 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 to the virus. Uh, you have the shutdown for like three or four weeks, and that induces uh, a uh, severe drop in consumption. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if uh, it's possible to uh, simulate that in your model here. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you will have to get the advice of a real economist because, uh, because that, that might be an interesting study, even though the simplicity of the model, this, this was uh, the original work of Samuelson and right. it was very celebrated. Uh, I will not say that he won the Nobel Prize for this model, but he, he won the Nobel Prize for all his insight and all the the, the developments that he brought up in, in economics. And this was one interesting model that, that pointed to many interesting facts, like, you know, you, you have algebraic constraints, you have dynamics, you have control inputs, you have disturbances, and, and all those things, uh, you know, very, very nicely called to the attention of control theorists. 
in, in the beginning, in the terms of optimization, and, and because the system was inherently linear, people were, were yeah. in the linear quadratic Gaussian approach. So, so that's, that's on the shutdown side, on the uh, stimulus package. Uh, from what I uh, uh, saw in the literature or in the, in the newspapers, uh, the uh, the control action was delayed. The uh, the, the the PPP, I mean the uh, the the personal protection uh, uh, package and the uh, uh, small business loans. They they all took weeks to uh, to kick in. So there's a natural delay. Uh, that's a perfect example for us yeah. to, to simulate uh, a delayed effect of the control action. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah. and this bring this uh, research to a contemporary hotbed uh, issue um, of economic activities uh, during the pandemic, and uh, there's a call for paper for a special issue in as ISA transactions <laughs> on on uh, on pandemics on on on, on this, uh, something like this. So 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 some uh, if somebody interested, maybe Haiyan, maybe somebody else interested to study this and uh, maybe bring uh, uh, up to date the Samuelson model and read some economic papers. And it could, could very well be, uh, you have very nice uh, uh, setup already uh, with ADRC, with the flight output uh, and with a uh, in-depth insight of uh, what each variable does and what it means. So it could very well be a paper. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, we we'll have to endure the criticism of actual economists, and <laughs> we have to be ready for that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, there, there are some very serious models of the of the pandemic that were put before before uh, before this uh, coronavirus uh, appeared uh, on the face of the earth. There were some interesting, very nice, discrete time models. I ran across one of them um, in a recent book, and uh, and there are algebraic constraints there, and it takes into account many many interesting aspects of pandemics in general. And uh, it's very much it's very much like a descriptor system of this sort, only that I think it's four dimensional, and it happens to be flat. I when I, I remember when I was reading that that part of a, a book that unfortunately I lost in my network and uh, even though I collect them in specific points of my computer, I it was never to find out that book again. It's a recent book by Springer Verlag on, on models of, of, uh, of pandemic, uh, very recent before, it was published before, the, before this, uh, this uh, pandemic, but um, but it, 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 it is a very nice third or fourth order model in which you really have many sectors involved, uh, which are important. I don't, uh, I, th there is no economics in that model. So if that model could be combined with an economic model, uh, that would be fantastic because the, mm -hmm. the connections of those two systems, uh, you see the, the, the pandemic generating this state of affairs interferes with the dynamics of the system through the social disturbances. And that, that would be a nice example if, if you can get sensible results that explain many of the things that are going on in our days. That's true, I agree. This is a, an interesting challenge for- I, I think for it's, it goes uh, to the very heart of ADRC. In the literature, people try to model this as accurately as possible. But, uh, but in the, in the uh, uh, framework of ADRC, if your purpose is to control it, here the purpose is to control it, to control uh, the uh, uh, national uh, economic activity. If that's your purpose, you do not need accurate model or no, no, no will you uh, uh, get it, if you, even if you want to. So, so you live with uncertainty, but ADRC provides you with a uh, free framework to deal with such uncertainties. I'm sure it's, uh, it's of uh, enormous value to economics. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, finding the right person to do it. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think Hayan is the right person to do it. <laughs> there is only one little point that I would like to make. Um, 
you know, when you have, when you do the simplification, when you do the simplification and you ascribe part of your dynamics to the disturbances, that, that can be justified in many, many ways. Um, but it is also true that your, your control action now has to overcome the effects of that neglected, uh, that neglected dynamics. And uh, an intermediate point of totally ignoring it or taking everything into account to ease the control uh, energy or the control magnitudes, uh, a middle ground is to retain in, the, in your model whatever is helping you. And this is the philosophy be, behind uh, passivity-based control. In passivity-based control, you don't eliminate everything, uh, in the feedback linearization or whatever other strategy. You don't try to eliminate whatever is helping you in achieving stability, for instance. You only eliminate the, the part that is troublesome. So, uh, for instance, in this, in this sort of dynamics, this is second order dynamics. And if this, if this term proves to be uh, uh, an unstable term, if it proves to be an unstable term in the sense that it provides with negative damping, uh, then, uh, then you, you should eliminate it. But on the other hand, if this term is beneficial in the sense that contributes to stabilize the system or to have some part in the stabilization process, then should, you, you should not eliminate that. That, that makes your controller action less drastic, uh, less uh, of lesser magnitude, and, uh, and also gives a nice combination of active disturbance rejection control with passivity-based control, which, which is very useful and, and has a very nice performance also. And is based on, this, on the dissipation structure of the system. And the dissipation structure of the system tells you that you have uh, three, at least three types of, of forces that you should consider. One is the indifferent forces, forces that come from oxidation dynamics that uh, put and take out energy in a periodic manner. That, that, that sort of neither gives you a trouble nor, nor it contributes to instability. To instability. The other part is, is the dissip, dissipative part of the dynamics that you should retain in your model and not destroy it, but on the contrary, try to enhance it. That's what, what uh, passivity-based control tells you. And the other one is definitely the, the unstable part of, of your dynamics, the anti-dissipative uh, terms in, in your dynamics. And in mechanical systems, those, those things are very clear to identify and ADRC at least can, can uh, you know, be combined, it's my belief, uh, with, uh, with passivity-based control in order to have more efficient designs and less demanding. Because you see, you see the, the, the government here in this simulation had to put a lot of, a lot of um, you know, control power in order to bring the economy to a nice consumption level and, uh, and the national income. If you see the actual expenditure here is like 40% of the national income. And in fact, what you had in this, in this economic package was quite large, billions, trillions of dollars. And, um, and this, this has an effect, an immediate effect on the investment. Uh, but by doing this, you actually pull up the investment to a new level. And, uh, and then it goes back to equilibrium at once everything is set into a new equilibrium value. All, all these things are very nice. And of course, mm -hmm. if you combine this with the pandemic effects and, and some dynamics for the disturbance represented by the pandemics, that, that would be a nice contribution of the ADRC community to, to obtain uh, a, nice, uh, a nice controller for, for that. And maybe you didn't have to spend that, that, much, that much money to, to move up the economy as you wanted. Yes, that, that's a good point, uh, Herbert. 
um, it has been uh, uh, be uh, it has become a more or less standard uh, to not throw everything into uh, uh, the disturbance. Uh, if you have a model information, you would keep it. You put it in the ESO. So to some extent, uh, a lot of people are doing that these days, but not under the umbrella of a passivity-based method, but based on the uh, this, just uh, a uh, common sense that in many cases you have a pretty good model and you estimate the uh, the difference between the real dynamics and the, the, the model dynamics. So yeah. that goes along with what was said. That's, that, that has become a more of a standard approach in ADRC. Good, thank you. Okay, so whatever we have said there can be generalized for an nth order model. We'll go very quickly through these uh, slides because it's repeating the same, but for an nth order model in which you have this canonical form input output re re represent, sorry, uh, representation of your system with some disturbances acting on your dynamics. And uh, I, I chose to put here um, the state space model, uh, as Professor Gao mentioned, it would be quite profitable to put the, the, integrate, the cascade integration form so that you gain robustness at each stage. And that is reflected into your observer. That, that cascade is reflected into your observer much in the same manner that it is reflected here in the uh, disturbance estimator variable Z. Now you would have the same effect in all the variables. And that, that brings you uh, a set of, of uh, poles at the, at the location uh, Q equals one which give you much more robustness with respect to other disturbances. And my, my point is that you're doing pretty well, as you saw in the previous example, with a simple model of the, of the disturbance estimator that incorporates that integration. When you do that, the estimation error satisfy equations which are very similar to the other ones. And from there, you obtain all the set of, of uh, transfer functions with this uh, factor, this, this canceling factor Q minus one in all the sensitivity functions of the estimation error of, of the state and the estimation error of the disturbance. And uh, from there, you can use those estimates in order to, to elaborate a linear feedback control law that stabilizes your system through the appropriate choice of this uh, coefficients, and also to try to cancel the dynamics from the feedback law, uh, cancel the disturbance from the feedback law. And in doing that, uh, we resort to the, to the equivalence of the actual state variables and collect them on the left side of the equation and see that in closed loop, you, you have a nice linear system with coefficients that can be chosen in will at will, and this linear system is excited by the state estimation errors and the disturbance uh, estimation errors. So if you manage your observer to have small errors, uh, that perturbation is, is affecting your closed loop dynamics, but it takes just a, a judicious choice of your, of your feedback um, coefficients in order to attenuate, further attenuate the contribution of these estimation errors. The idea is that they, these evolve very close to zero and therefore the, the disturbance is small. And if this is strongly uh, stable, then, then you have further attenuation of those effects. And therefore you can have a nice performance for trajectory tracking. In this case, we're doing trajectory tracking, just computing the input error in terms of the output tracking error. And uh, from there, you, you obtain your, your transfer function in a manner that explicitly gives you the characteristic polynomial of the controller separated from the characteristic polynomial of the observer. This, this, uh, this product, uh, if you want to respect whatever this procedure is giving you in a natural manner, is to, to to have the separation principle uh, acting on you by designing the observer in, a, in an independent manner of the controller. And uh, 
well, what the fact that we chose a reduced order observer makes these two polynomials of the same order. That's the only the only uh, emerging fact from the reduced order observer. It gives you two polynomials of the same order, and therefore uh, your design is is kind of simpler to accomplish. But there is nothing nothing uh, against using a full order observer. You just add one more lag into the estimation process, but but that's very small compared with the you know with the performance that you can that you can obtain. So the 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 disturbance uh, sensitivity functions uh, are dominated by the fact that the controller and the observer respect the separation principle, and uh, and therefore you have a clear view of of, of your design and the numerator is kind of complicated it's a double sum it's a double sum of, of interactions between the coefficients of the observer and the controller and uh, that's part of the let's say the zero dynamics once you once you manage to to make this very close to zero your disturbance is is driving your zero dynamics so uh, this convolution this is a sort of convolution of these two polynomials in fact when you when you work this out in in full detail and you obtain this product, you will see that in the controller you will have a, a spread of the coefficients of this product in the number in the denominator and the numer numerator of the transfer function of your controller, and therefore, uh, from the definition of the disturbance sensitivity function, which is the one we obtain here. You can compute the the controller, and the controller is is in in a form that is given by a transfer function, very easy to implement. It's driven by the tracking error, and the precompensation uh, helps the the establishment of the control input in a, in dynamic terms. So the controller is an, an nth order controller, and uh, the closed loop system is a two nth order system, and this would be the exact uh, way in which the observer dynamics appear, these differences of coefficients clearly tell you that you have a factor of Q minus one hidden in this polynomial. So that Q minus one is going to appear uh, in this factor and therefore you will obtain that factor in the numerator of, uh, in the denominator of the controller. And, um, and that complies with internal model principle bestow some robustness uh, just inherited from, from the simple integrator equation uh, of the estimator of the disturbance. If, if you do that in the rest of the state variables, of course, the, the disturbance, the, the robustness is going to be enhanced and that is worthwhile pursuing. Therefore, uh, you you obtain every everything in, in, in good terms is the same for stabilization as for trajectory tracking the difference is, is only uh, very very small the difference of two is just uh, in form it's not it's not an actual difference to solve a trajectory uh, trajectory tracking problem or a stabilization problem it's basically the same it's only that that um, you feed the output in one case, you feed the output tracking error in the other case. The control is, is uh, solving the stabilization problem. The control error is solving the stabilization of the tracking error to zero, which is the trajectory tracking problem. So uh, this, would be the, this would be the form of the controller in causal, in causal terms by multiplying numerator and denominator by a a negative power of Q. And, and this would be the um, characteristic polynomial in closed loop. You have a two nth order system, nth order because the plant is nth order, and another nth order because the extended observer in reduced form is also nth order, so you have two n order system. And the, the block diagram for that is, is, is very nice. You, you see that you're not touching the internal states of your, of your plant. It is perturbed uh, by this term here. And you have all these uh, endogenous injections uh, 
representing the output tracking error endogenously injected into this string of, of delays. That string of delays resembles very much the string of delays in the system. And therefore you have a sort of a, a mimic of the model which is affected by the endogenous injections and the exogenous feedbacks taken from the control input. So the interplay of endogenous injections and exogenous feedbacks is very much at the heart of ADRC in continuous time and also in discrete time. And incidentally, this allows you to extend the idea of, of your ADRC controller when you have a, a sliding mode, a sliding mode arena. In the sliding mode arena, you will have a nonlinear block here uh, dispensing this continuous control input signals in the form of maximum amplitude on and off. And uh, that would be the main difference with this, with this block diagram. When you're doing sliding modes, all these ex endogenous injections and exogenous feedback is synthesizing a sufficiently compensated sliding surface, which is, is obtained at this point of the diagram. And that sliding surface goes into a nonlinearity, which is represented by an ideal switch. And the switch actions are bestowed into the system as normally done in power electronics. So this, this scheme also tells you immediately that there is a close connection of sliding mode control with ADRC and with classical compensation networks. This sort of, of scheme is typical of compensation networks that do not rely on, on state measurements, but it's only synthesized in terms of inputs and outputs. And, um, and therefore, uh, with the help of Hayan, I, we, we worked out a, a sort of a table in which you're given a first order plant, a second order plant, a third order plant, and we worked out the, the controller form and the characteristic polynomials. Uh, for the first order plant, there is no reduced order observer, so you have a difference in the orders of the controller and the observer but the form is, is, is robust. And, um, and uh, you have the sensitivity functions uh, much better behaved than in the preceding naive case. You have large attenuation at, at, at small frequencies, or at low frequencies, and you also tend to have large attenuation at high frequencies. Remember the, the body diagrams are periodic in, in discrete time. So here we only have one period. And uh, this is a good, a good sign for the sensitivity function, although there is some very small amplification at the intermediate uh, frequencies. That can be better by, by, a, by a choice of, of uh, scaling parameters into your observer or your controller. Therefore, we, we recover some of the features of a continuous time system in the body diagrams, which uh, this is called the gang of four, which is crucial for assessing the stability of the system. So having large attenuation at slow frequencies for the sensitivity function, uh, which is the one relating the, the input reference to the tracking error, uh, gives you nice attenuation for, for, uh, for the, the disturbances, which are low frequency and nice attenuation for the measurement uh, noises. And the disturbance sensitivity function has the same characteristics. The complementary sensitivity function now is as it, should, as it should be, which have, uh, you know, zero gain or complete transmission in the closed loop transfer function for low frequencies and attenuation at high frequencies. And the load sensitivity function tells you that the relation between the tracking error and the control input is nice because you, you don't have amplification or large control inputs um, to be dealt with in your feedback scheme and you have attenuation at, at high frequency noises. Therefore, um, we, you can proceed to make a plant or either build a computer program to obtain symbolically all the features of the of the ADRC controller with the robustness prescribed only in the 
disturbance estimation variable, but you can extend that to uh, every one of the states in the in the integrated form. So you do have more reasonable uh, transfer functions, and for the third order plan, it, it starts becoming a little bit more complicated in terms of the coefficients that you have to deal with. But uh, you know it can be gone forever, and the program can can easily give you the output if you need it for a larger order plan. So let me give you very quickly an example in which we have applied this to a sample system of a supply chain in which you have a, a, a P represents a, a, a production of, of goods, I is the inventory, and D is the demand. The demand is acting as a disturbance because sometimes you don't know what people are going to be looking for or what are they going to be needing. And uh, the production also, also always has a delay uh, built into the dynamics of the system because you cannot produce the demanded good immediately. So you, you, you resort to your inventory in order to, to, uh, to satisfy the, the demand, which is unforeseen. And it, it, it makes everything ready for, a, for an active disturbance rejection controller, in which you have disturbances, you have you have this will generate a, a higher dimensional representation of the system because in discrete time these delays are sort of not very meaningful in the sense that you can uh, handle them by an extension of the dimension of your plan and uh, that's what we do right here so the, the the problem here is to be able to to planify the demand and, the, and to control the demand, I'm sorry, to, to planify the inventory and to be able to move the inventory from one level to another desired level. And uh, in that manner, you will have possibilities of, of matching your demand or uh, at least have provisions to lower your inventory when, when the tax man comes around asking what is all this merchandise doing sitting there. So uh, you can plan for the inventory, and in fact, the inventory uh, is, is the flat output. And what you want to do is to track some trajectory, some desired trajectory for the inventory. So you have a trajectory tracking problem. And, um, and uh, from there, you have a delayed dynamics uh, in integral form for the, for the production planning. And that that uh, can be handled through an extension of the dynamics of the system and you propagate this disturbance which is affecting your immediate present all the way uh, down to a previous present in which the combined effect of this is taken into account. So what we do is we, we produce a higher dimensional uh, representation of the plant with the control input being somewhere in the in, in here and uh, and the disturbance is lumped into into the dynamics of the system in a match form uh, since you will not need the intermediate states uh, you don't have to worry about the definition of these state variables containing some influence of the disturbance and that's that's something that, that flatness can achieve for you so you have a simplified model in which you have a dynamics now, now the integration uh, is, is clearly shown here in terms of these factors, and you have the, the control input, uh, trying to control this input output representation where I1 is the trajectory tracking error, and EP is the production uh, strategy error. And uh, doing that, uh, you, ha you have a simplified dynamics in which all these terms of integration can be lumped into the disturbance again. So you, you can, you can set, you know, resort back to the dynamics in which you don't have any contribution of the integrator effects, or you can take advantage of that in your observer and obtain a more robust scheme by producing a better estimate of the disturbance. But as we will see here, this scheme is also valid and uh, it only affects the disturbance estimation error. You have, uh, you have a more traditional form in this manner, and it's very easy to implement, uh, the control is very easy to implement 
uh, without many computations on, on the coefficients, which can become a burden, a burden if, if, if the order M of the system is relatively large. So the, the disturbance here, we, we are lumping the exogenous disturbance arising from the sample nature of the system and the exogenous disturbance uh, ascribed to the in match form to the last equation. But I repeat, this, this is a choice. You, if you don't want to do this, then you can go ahead and, uh, and do your integration. And uh, we did some simulations for this. We put only just one delay in the input. So we have a second order system just for illustrative purposes. And, uh, and you have the effect of the integrator here that you, that you neglect uh, by using this simplified model of the of the inventory system, but I repeat, you can you can retain this term, and the observer comes out to be better. Only that that the expression for the control is much more complicated, uh, in in the numerator and denominator polynomials. By doing that and placing the poles appropriately, um, you obtain a design. And your design here is clearly separating the, the controller and the observer part. It doesn't really make any difference because in the transfer function, this, these two things are mixed. And uh, you might say this is the controller, but actually that will be the observer. It doesn't matter. There is no way to differentiate between the controller and the observer in, the, in this particular scheme. And because of the symmetry we built into the, into the the poly characteristic polynomials by choosing a, a reduced order observer. The effect will be there in, in, uh, in the closed loop form. So if you want to move your inventory from one equilibrium point to another equilibrium point and you have a demand trajectory perturbation input, which is significant, is about 5% of the desired, 5% uh, of the initial equilibrium, but this is like, uh, 20% of the final equilibrium, this disturbance, um, you will have a nice performance uh, in spite of the disturbances. And you have a production strategy that uh, sort of lowers down to allow the inventory to be reduced by attending your demand. And your demand is quite fluctuating. And, um, and with that, with that um, I would like to stop here. There is another example that I may send to Professor Gao on congested computer congestion networks, and um, the model is also very nice, and there is a lot of issues there. But um, let me let me stop at this point and take any any uh, questions that you might have. Yeah, like. Like, like we said at the beginning of this uh, lecture, this is the last lecture. And uh, uh, let's uh, take some time to address questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. we, we thank you uh, for the audience to stick around for all seven lectures. And uh, <laughs> we have a lot of videos uh, online. I mean, after the uh, recording is submitted online, this is a, a 100, 200 the people uh, will, will, will come and uh, watch these uh, lectures. So, um, but let's let's open it up for the for the floor to uh, uh, to welcome questions. Oh no, it's it's my pleasure to to uh, be able to tell you the things that I have been doing here with Professor Gao uh, during this visit. I have really enjoyed uh, working with him and having all his his input uh, coming from a large experience and a first-hand uh, first knowledge of, of, of these issues uh, through the, the interaction with Professor Han. Uh, I believe there is a lot of things to be, to be done in, in, in ADRC and many, many people around the world and especially in China are doing wonderful work with the mathematics behind behind this scheme. And it's calling the attention of very renowned uh, researchers as, as that uh, were somehow reluctant to accept the ideas in the beginning. And, uh, and uh, I will address you to the current literature in which you see very prestigious names associated to 
to things which we have been dealing with uh, in ADRC for, for some time. It's, it's only a pity that uh, they tangentially recognize the, the contributions made by Professor Gao and by Professor Han uh, at the beginning of all this. But, uh, well, uh, that's, that's the way it is in our community. People tend to reference uh, more recent work and because uh, other, other contributions are not readily available. But I guess at the end, one has the pleasure of seeing that, that this, this, is a, this is a nice area to work in and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful uh, conception and simplicity and elegance behind all this. And uh, if one can contribute, even though tangentially to, to the area, that, that, that's welcome, I believe. And I, I thank you very much for your attention all these all these uh, weeks, so that we could have interacted through, through the network mm -hmm. uh, in in the pursuit of of obtaining a counterpart for a DRC in discrete time. Of course, there are many other things that can be done, many many others. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a very nice uh, summary. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, we, we are really honored to uh, have your presence. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. It is my honor and my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we, we learned yeah. a lot from the, both lectures, the, both lecture series, first on the uh, geometric control and, uh, and then the uh, discrete, uh, uh, ADR discrete uh, uh, flatness approach. Um, and they gave us a very nice perspective on uh, the, the deep, the depth of your research of 40 years. You know, that's the astonishing uh, accumulation of uh, work. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we are, we are, we're fortunate uh, to, uh, to have your presence in our lab. Uh, we learned a lot. I mean, I speak on behalf of my uh, uh, students and also within within scholars and uh, and uh, on behalf of uh, my collaborators at Kingston State and beyond. So we uh, we thank you. And I also got this question uh, about flatness. What is flatness? What does it do? What the, could you uh, help us uh, maybe summarize uh, your research uh, uh, in flatness? Why people need to understand flatness? What uh, uh, extra benefit it brings to the table. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, one of the, of the central issues in, in systems area is the, the early contributions of, of Kahneman to, to really put a, a mathematical framework that could be understood by engineers and could be translated into design. And for that, some fundamentals like controllability, concept of observability, have to be the, the heart of, uh, of dynamical systems, uh, especially linear, continuous or discrete time. Uh, and uh, those concepts had some obstacles to be understood in the area of linear systems, and not to mention infinite dimensional systems, like, you know, delay systems and, and uh, systems described by partial differential equation. Uh, the concept of controllability in those areas uh, had, been, had been looked at by, by many, many people uh, over the years with a strong theoretical inclination and with a difficult to be generalized. So here comes uh, a contribution of, of Michel Fleece after visiting Rudolf Kalman for, for a sabbatical in Florida, in which, um, in which he proposed a new look at controllability in more general terms. And he found out because of his knowledge in algebra, 
and especially in differential algebra, which was one of the topics that he had studied for a number of years, uh, to propose a natural extension of the concept of controllability to nonlinear systems. And this natural extension happened to be algebraic in nature, as Kalman had already previewed by using module theory into discrete time systems and continuous time systems of linear nature. So it turned out that by looking at, at this extension, you had a nice generalization of the, of the most elementary extension into the nonlinear arena of a linear concept, which is controllability. And parallel to what uh, Michel was doing, the feedback linearization problem had been worked out by Rocket and Herman and the many others, Isidori and, uh, and uh, Krenner and many others. And I believe Professor Hahn also had a beautiful contribution in, in, in those days or earlier to that. And, um, and uh, it happened to, to be a nice coincidence that flatness was being developed and was immediately related to the feedback linearization problem. So, but it, it's actually a, a structural aspect of the system that comes naturally out of the algebraic formulation of nonlinear systems and linear systems using module theory. The basis of a module is the flat out. And, um, and uh, transcendence and all those concepts in differential algebra had a very, very natural and immediate interpretation to the problem of feedback linearization for single input, single output nonlinear system and feedback linearization for multiple input, multiple output systems and dynamic feedback linearization as the last, as the last resort. And there was always the problem of finding necessary and sufficiency conditions for the existence of a flat output. That, this was not ma an easy mathematical problem. So Michel Fleece, by his own account, took uh, in an opportunity that he was in Russia, took it to one of the, one of the leaders in the, in the area of differential geometry in infinite dimensions, which was Professor Vinogradov. And Professor Vinogradov is known for very abstract contributions into the area of, of the generalization of, of Galois theory to nonlinear systems and nonlinear differential systems. And that extension also goes through to algebraic geometry, which is by no means a, a simple, a simple uh, area. And Professor Vinogradov listened with a lot of attention to, to Michel Fleece, uh, exposing the, the basic obstacles to obtain sufficient conditions for flatness. And Vinogradov and his equipment, people, very talented people, worked in the problem for some time, and they finally gave up. So um, the problem is really, really hard. But the practical implications, and this is, this is basically the, the paradigmatic issue that, that becomes, uh, becomes difficult to understand. The practical implications of flatness are, are very much uh, impressive. You don't, you don't need to have a complete mathematical theory behind this, even though it's sustained, whatever is available is sustained by differential algebra. You don't need that in order to be able to apply, to apply flatness to dynamical systems. Very natural in, in linear systems. It just coincides with the concept of controllability. Mm -hmm. Flatness and controllability are equivalent for linear systems, linear or discrete, um, whether time invariant or time varying. And it's a natural extension to, to 
you know, systems of single input, single output nature, it becomes a very nice practical tool for design because the parametrization that you obtain of all variables through flatness allows you to do planning and allows to simplify your control scheme to a linear control scheme. And this is where ADRC comes in. ADRC is naturally geared to obtain uh, control schemes from, from an input-output representation and even from a state space representation in canonical form. So very nicely, uh, flatness gives you everything you need to know in, in nonlinear systems to transform your system to a linear system. And people tend to, com to, to mistake this with feedback linearization. It's, it's much more than that. Feedback linearization is one of the outcomes of the flatness property. But the other property is parametrization of states, parametrizations of inputs, taking into account algebraic constraints, as you saw in that simple problem, in a very natural manner without going through a theory of descriptive systems. Uh, it allows you to parameterize equilibria. It allows you to do design. It allows you to look into the non-minimum phase issues with, with, uh, with a design tool that proves to be successful in, in, in some interesting practical cases. The implications are vast. So um, this is uh, an invitation uh, to look into, into that and, uh, and benefit from the multiple possibilities that flatness offers, not only in analysis, but also in design. And this is a unique feature of, of the, of the uh, concept of flatness in linear and nonlinear. It has been extended to infinite dimensional systems, of course, and, uh, and you have beautiful parametrizations there which which uh, are not trivial to obtain if you didn't have the concept somehow hidden in your mental process to to face this type of problem. Uh, infinite dimensional systems are very challenging. And one of the things that emerges clearly from flatness is that, that there is a lot that you can do in open loop control of those systems because the, the technology is not at a stage that allows you to have distributed sensors and distributed actuators, but at least the, the structural properties allow you to have very nice insight into the most difficult type of, of uh, dynamical systems that exist, which are related to infinite dimensional systems or systems described by either partial differential equations or by delay uh, differential equations. And, uh, and that's something that other methods cannot venture into because they don't have the theoretical power. Those methods are not endowed with the theoretical power that flatness has enjoyed all these years. And of course, a, a person geared towards theoretical issues will find uh, ample areas for contribution in the area of the theory behind flatness. And the practical engineer, the practical person who wants to understand the system quickly and see how to proceed to analyze the main features of the differential algebraic system um, uh, describing the, the plan can benefit by a, a in a straightforward manner of a, of a design process that is very much systematic. Of course, intuition plays a big role in, in, in getting the, the flat output because uh, it's normally done by, by means of inspection. And there you have to be lucky to, to, to look at the, at the equations and be able to sense what the flat output is going to be and try it out and come out to the conclusion that this is actually the flat output. Um, that, that's something that is lacking in the theory, you know, necessary and sufficient condition. But given, given f of x and u as, as your right-hand side of your plan in n dimensions, here is a formula that gives you the, the fact that the, the system is flat or not. And, um, and uh, many, many systems in practice are, are flat. 
the, the challenge is that if you open a nonlinear system book in, a, in any page and there is an example in the vicinity of that page, with probability one, that system will be flat. But that, that's a challenge. And, uh, and uh, that tells you how widespread and how ubiquitous is this concept in engineering systems. So uh, let me, uh, there's uh, quite a bit that you said. Uh, let me uh, start by saying, uh, by, 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 uh, by uh, rephrasing it, so uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that in flatness, we discover or re-explore a hidden property of a dynamic system, linear or nonlinear, right? Number one. Number two, uh, going back to a uh, common original work in the 60s, and this was a uh, 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 code by Carmen uh, himself, a general, uh, a general uh, theory of control system. I think it was the paper in IFAT 1960. And uh, in that paper, there was a comment by a Russian scholar, challenging Kalman, uh, saying, how can this be a general theory if it only applies to linear systems? And the Karma has no answer to this. And uh, apparently, Michel Fleece uh, addressed this issue of his own. And uh, um, so that's the second uh, 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 branch to this. And you devoted your entire career to further the cause, further the uh, development of this uh, flattening based understanding and design. So by taking advantage of flatness property, you simplify uh, the design, uh, control design, especially for nonlinear systems, right? So, so you, 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 you take this hidden property and you solve this with, the flat, uh, with flatness. And uh, in doing so, you simplify the design of a uh, control system for linear and nonlinear systems. So, so that's, that's number three. Uh, uh, correct me. No, no, no. Yeah. That's a very nice summary. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, um, in connection to practice, that we uh, often uh, are limited by the choice of uh, sensors. By by sensing, uh, our output uh, are defined by what we what we measure. And naturally, by almost by uh, uh, by by default, we assume that's something we control. But in flatness, in flatness, you challenge that notion. In flatness, you 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 you, you discover or ex you uh, explore that there should be a, a, a consideration on what variable we control. Yeah, and, and uh, by ex by. Then by going back to the uh, uh, Michel Fleet's work and algebraic property of system, in particular, you are exposing the algebraic connection or uh, relationship uh, among uh, system variables. And uh, uh, flatness, uh, uh, flat output is just particular state variable where all other variables can be parameterized off, right? So, so by controlling the flat output, by controlling this particular variable, you can control all of this. Yeah. Okay? So, so, so now you, now you are challenging the traditional notion of what is the output. <laughs> it's not simply by, uh, by, 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 the, by the choice of sensor, but by the algebraic properties of your dynamic system. I think that's maybe the most important um, insight that we obtain from all your lectures is we challenge the notion of the uh, output to be controlled. Uh, and of, uh, uh, and then uh, maybe uh, uh, lastly, uh, it's, uh, it's the uh, uh, practical implication. In numerous papers that you demonstrated that by selecting the correct flight output variable to control, you, you make a challenging problem simple or <laughs> at least easier to, to deal with. So they have enormous practical implications. Yeah. 
So of the two lecture series you give us, that's that's uh, uh, primarily primarily what I uh, can uh, take away from this. So so back to you. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. That that's uh, the best summary I've heard um, on uh, on point by point. Uh, manner of, uh, of flatness and, and its implications. Um, the hope is that engineers uh, learn to, to view this not as a theoretical fancy development that you know fills up theorems and books and pages of demonstrations, but something that you can actually use in real life design. I have enjoyed my last 22 years in Mexico with my students, uh, I should say they're bright, they were bright students, doing actual experimentation around flatness in many other areas that we were uh, exploring at the time. And in the last few years, let's say the last eight years or so, since I met Professor Gao uh, on location in Washington, D.C., to, to be using and applying uh, ADRC uh, in combination with flatness to many laboratory experimental setups with good with good performance, excellent performance that, that sort of challenges many other techniques that are available in the engineering side. So if you can do things like this in a lab with, with a, a young man that, that uh, understands the electronics and understands the implementation issues and understands the sampling and the computers and the codes, then then you're in your way to do actually very interesting and very challenging applications. And the, this is the hope. Uh, the hope is that uh, the people actually use this uh, for the benefit of, of that. C control is, is really a joyful area because uh, as Peter Kukorovic put it many years ago, the joy of feedback is unsurpassed. <laughs> when you, <laughs> When you when you actually see something working in real life, motor a converter, a mechanical system doing interesting and challenging maneuvers, then then you really are experiencing some some connection with what should be and not what it is, but in in the area of, of the difficulty of, of right. doing things. I I. Uh... Uh, I, I want to add, add one more uh, here. Uh, uh, in, in 2012, one of my colleagues, Hans Richter, uh, met me in a parking garage and told me that he just came back from a Latin American conference and, and the first speaker uh, in the plenary session spoke nothing but the ADRC. <laughs> and I was very surprised because I, I didn't know anybody at, at that time in Latin America, in South America, uh, in the controls uh, community. So I looked it up online, it's all in Spanish. So I, so I did a Google translation, and sure enough, uh, the translation came back active disturbance rejection control. <laughs> so that was uh, uh, 2012, uh, and then in 2013, we met, uh, we had a uh, workshop on ADRC in the American Control Conference in Washington, D.C., and uh, you graciously, uh, you graciously uh, uh, came and uh, gave uh, a uh, talk um, on, 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 on ADRC and you worked GPI and also uh, on, on flatness. We were puzzled, to be honest, by, by, by the flatness approach because we never heard about it. And uh, so in, in 2013, I think in the summer, uh, we took you to, uh, to Beijing to uh, uh, the, uh, the Science and Technology University of Beijing, uh, and then to the Beijing Institute of Technology. And you gave a talk on flatness, uh, uh, on a short, a short series of uh, talks uh, in both places. So that's the beginning of uh, us getting, uh, getting um, uh, familiar uh, to, uh, to, uh, to your work. And, uh, uh, and I, I, the final comments I want to make uh, the, with flatness, I think you really expose the native uh, form of all dynamic system, the native form of all dynamic system. Because after you find the right variable and you reduce the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the dynamic equation, uh, whether a difference equation or, 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 or uh, 
uh, differential equation, you reduce it to a form uh, amenable to ADRC, and that is the uh, cascade integral form. That's a, I call it a Han canonical form because he discovered it in 1979, I think ahead of everyone else. Everyone else. And that's really, to me, multi form of all dynamic system and flatness, flatness gave us that form when we find the right variables, meaning the flat output. So, so it's a, it's a, a so, so to me, it's a no coincidence that um, uh, it leads you to ADRC and, and you're very gracious in the coding at ADRC, uh, while other, pref uh, other, other scholars may insist on their own names, but you, you very graciously switch the name from uh, the previous uh, uh, terms that to, to ADRC. And uh, we, in the, in the ADRC community, we, uh, we, we always thank you for, for that. And we appreciate uh, your, acad uh, your academic integrity. And I, I said, I, I won't say the game. So, uh, yeah, I, I also uh, want to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to see if anybody else had questions uh, for Professor Cyril Merz. This is uh, maybe uh, um, the, the, the last chance before uh, he, went back, he goes back to uh, Mexico and maybe in the future to China. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, very much looking forward to that. Any, anyone else? Uh, well, it's uh, it's getting okay. late. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for all this wonderful time we spent here. Even though it's seclusion, but uh, it was very sweet to be here and be able to uh, work in, in things that uh, we both share an interest on. Thank you for all your input. Uh, I'll be developing this into some lecture notes and uh, I'll let you know when I feel it's ready so that we can have a publisher to be able to do this hopefully together. Great. We are looking forward to, uh, to seeing your book. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, I did enjoy this very much and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very Martin much. Is, yeah. Martin is sweet sorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much to all of you for your interaction. Thank you, Professor. Bye bye. Professor Gang. Gracias. Bye. And Hayan uh, and everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gang.